So today we are going to talk about uh, analysis of coherence, um, and then I think we should have some time. So um, I'll start uh, exploratory factor analysis, but not using M plus. Um, I think we'll do M plus next class, which I think should be Saturday. Um, so today I'm going to uh, do uh, exploratory factor analysis in SPSS, but also um, I'll introduce some syntax uh, like map test and parallel analysis, which you need to use syntax. So let's first uh, um, talk about analysis of coherence. So the reason for us to use analysis covariance is that we want to introduce a covariant or several covariance to control the potential effects of some variables. Um, that's why when we are using uh, analysis of covariance, we are saying we want to uh, evaluate uh, the population means uh, here Population means are maybe cell means or marginal means. Um, if we are saying cell means, maybe we are uh, comparing uh, uh, complex mean comparisons like test interaction effect. Uh, but also, if we want to uh, compare cell means, maybe uh, we are doing a pairwise comparison. And also, maybe sometimes we will have more than two factors, then we are comparing population means, uh, which should be marginal means. So here I'm just stating generally, say we are evaluating population means on the dependent variable um, to see whether they are the same across different levels of a factor or uh, several factors controlling for the effects of a covariant. So that's uh, uh, main reason for us to use covert. We want to control the effects of covert on the dependent variable. Uh, that's ANCOVA. Um, typically, when we are having a pre-post design, um, we many times introduce pretest as a covert. This is quite common in experimental design. Um, for me, uh, that's a time when I use analysis of covariance for the most of the time. Uh, but also, if you remember, when you have a pre-post design, you can do gain score or different score by uh, by subtracting the pretest score from post-test uh, to get a gain score, um, which we had an example in previous class, right? Um, and also. In other times when we have demogra demographic variables that may influence the dependent variable, um, we want to introduce these variables as a covariant to control for the effects. Uh, this is, I think, the circumstances that I can come up uh, that are some common covariants. Um, if you can come up with some other examples, uh, we can add more. But I want to um, reiterate one thing is that um, when we are considering a covariant or several covariants, we really need to con uh, con consider the literature. I know uh, some publications will have some statistical analysis, say there are some differences on the covariance, so that's why we introduce that variable as a covariant. Or there are some statistical techniques to support us using that variable or those variables as covariants. Um, but uh, uh, I here, I really want you to uh, take into account the uh, literature when you are considering having a covariant or covariants. Um, that is not a decision made made based on statistical analysis. But I really want you to think about some theories or literature that can help you to decide whether you need a covert or not. Um, 
So the advantage of having a covert is say, when you introduce your covert, then you are kind of uh, partially out the variance from the error, from the denominator. So ideally, if you having a covert or zero covert, then the error term from the F equation, so that's basically from the denominator will be smaller. So if the denominator is smaller, then you'll have larger F values. That is to say, you'll have more chances to see significant results. That's the uh, advantage of having a covert or zero covariance. You kind of have the error, partition the variance uh, from the error term by introducing the uh, covert. Um, but this is ideally uh, what happened. Uh, sometimes if you have a poor reliability of your measures, sometimes we'll find that after introducing a covariant, you still have a quite large error term, still non-significant results. That may be due to your uh, poor design of the items, your measurement issue, um, maybe large measurement error, something like that. So that's why I said ideally, if you have covariant, then it can help you reduce the error term from the denominator. Okay. Um, there are some statistical assumptions related to analysis of covariants, and uh, uh, I don't think in this class we have talked about assumptions yet, uh, but uh, I think you should know there are assumptions when you're conducting statistical analysis. For example, if you do t-test, then there are some assumptions you should uh, uh, make. For example, normality. Uh, sometimes if you do independent sample t-test, you assume uh, homogeneity of variance. Independence, you have you randomly assign each individual into conditions, so they are independent. So these are the uh, assumptions not just uh, uh, for ANCOVA, but also for other statistical tests. For example, t-test, ANOVA. Um, I think uh, most of the quantitative uh, methods require the normality assumption. Um, and uh, for I think most of the uh, statistical analysis require uh, independence, which is say each individual should be independent from each other. But uh, uh, today I want to talk about the uh, one assumption which many times people tend to ignore, which is called the homogeneity of slopes assumption. So what's that? Um, it's similar to homogeneity of variance assumption in t-tests, but actually it's related to slopes. So where comes the slopes? So if we look at this, uh, graph say remember we have a dependent variable and we may have one or more independent variable and also in analysis of covariants we have covariant one covariant or zero covariants let's assume we have only one covariant so there should be a linear relationship between the covariant and dependent variable so that's why you see from this graph there, there are three lines here. The slope of this line reflects the relationship, actually it's a re linear relationship between the covariant and the dependent variable. So the homogeneity of slope assumption say, um, so you see there are three different lines. Actually these three different, different lines are three levels of the independent variables. This is just a simple example. So you can assume if you have a independent variable with several levels, maybe so two treatment groups and one control groups, then you have three levels, three conditions. So that's the say the homogeneity of slopes assumption say so this slope, so the a slope between the covariant and dependent variable is the same across all of these groups created by these independent variables. So if we look at this statement, it says in the population, the covariant is linearly related to the dependent variable within all levels of the factor and the slopes relating to the 
relating the covariant to the dependent variable are equal across all levels of the factor. That's the homogeneity of slopes assumption. Um, so let's look at the uh, graph again. So that is to say, these slopes are the same in different groups, and these groups are actually created by uh, your independent variables, your manipulation. And uh, um, I want to um, reiterate one thing here is, in the population, when we are saying statistical assumptions, um, we are talking about the things happening in the population. For example, uh, when we are saying normality, we are saying the dependent variable is normally distributed in the population, not in the sample. And also, here the same, homogeneity of slopes assumption said in the population, these slopes are the same. So that's the uh, assumption for the ANCOVA, which is quite unique. Because in analysis of variance, you don't have a covariance, so you don't have a you don't have such slopes. So for this assumption, actually, you need to test test that before you conducting uh, actual analysis of covariance. Um, so because we assume that uh, at each value of the covariant, these differences are the same. So these these lines are parallel. So when the covariant is at this value, these differences and the, when the covariant is at this value, these are the differences. These differences are the same because these lines are parallel. That is to say, these slopes are, are the same. Um, we actually need to test this assumption uh, statistically before we run in the uncover. And many people, um, I think many, many people uh, ignore that, maybe, or forget about it. Um, so that's why I want to mention that. Um, so actually I have an example here. A very simple example. Um, there are three experimental conditions. Placebo, low dose vitamin C, high dose vitamin C, and then there are two variables. One is a dependent variable, the number of days with cold symptoms um, during the intervention. And then there is also a kind of pretest the number of days with cold symptoms in the first year before treatment. So we have a, I think we have three variables. The data is actually on the website. Um, So actually, we can statistically test the homogeneity of slope assumption before we conduct analysis of covariance. And we can actually do that. So here, this is independent variable. This is the uh, kind of pretest, post-test. Um, so let's do ANCOVA. Uh, independent variable as a fixed factor, and then this is uh, days of code, post days, so that's a post test, and then pre test as a covariant. Um, I say usually our covariants are continuous variables. I say usually our covariants are continuous variables in the ANCOVA context. Um, when you have Categorical variables, sometimes you can do regression analysis. Um, I think in other courses, I, I think I covered some of the topics. When you have regression analysis, you can also do main facts interaction, simple main facts analysis. Um, uh, so usually I will request a pairwise comparison. Usually I do LSD, um, descriptive statistics. Eta square. Um, 
So remember, before you testing the um, the un un analysis of covariance, we need to test the homogeneity of slope assumption. Actually, we can uh, do like this uh, model. You can click model here, and then we do custom customized model. Uh, there is so it should be group pre days, and then. The most important is that you create an interaction between independent variable and covariate. So by looking at this interaction, the interaction between the independent variable and covariate on the dependent variable, we can actually uh, statistically test the homogeneity of slope assumption. And I think that's we, uh, we, should, we should be good. Oh, by the way, uh, I realized I, I don't think I, I'm doing a good job doing the graph. So if you really want to do graph, so uh, I can show you how to do some graph. Um, I'm not very good at doing graph because sometimes I don't think there is a need for me to do graph. Um, in my writing, sometimes I just write, and uh, if I feel it's sufficient for the writing, then I don't do graph. And then, for me, if I want to present my research in a conference, then sometimes I feel, uh, for example, at AERA, American Educational Research Association, uh, sometimes I feel people don't care or don't like reading statistics. So when I'm presenting, sometimes I'll just put a conclusion. That's why um, I'm not using graph very often. Um, you can consider this is my limitation. Um, this is just my style. So in order to create a graph here, we can do a scatter plot to create a graph similar like uh, this one. This is the uh, ideal situation in the population, but we actually can create a, some kind of graph like that in the sample. Um, so we can do scatter plot. Scatter plot, uh, sim simple scatter, define, and then we can. So usually x axis and y axis don't matter, uh, but uh, conventionally we put a, uh, we put a pre test on the x axis and post it on the y-axis, I say conventionally, but usually it doesn't matter. Um, and then you put the independent variable as a marker, and then you can create the, uh, the plot. And then you have the plot, and the, now you also need to modify the plot a little bit. Um, if you're looking at this plot, there is no, no line here. Um, so. If you want to tell people there are, these dots actually include three groups, three experimental groups, then it's hard to tell. So usually we'll add some subgroup lines to fit to the data. Um, I'm not sure if you guys can have that because I'm using SPSS 20. Sometimes I, I think... Um, I think for other versions of SPSS, maybe it's a little bit different. Um, but that's the way I created this graph. Um, so by, by having these lines, you can clearly see in the sample if there are any difference or not between these three groups. Uh, you, you can further modify the graph if you want. Um, for example, you can change the color, the shape of these dots, or the uh, color or shape of these lines, so that they can be distinguishable in um, black and white print. In case sometimes when we print, uh, there is no color print, so you need to modify the graph further. Uh, okay. That's a graph. Um, remember, we just did some uh, statistical analysis testing the homogeneity of slope assumption. Uh, I think I have the results here.
So if you look at the graph, um, it seems that maybe these slopes are not equal. And I say maybe, it's, it's hard to tell because this is sample and then maybe uh, with larger samples, then these lines may be parallel. And then let's look at the results. Uh, we are actually interested in the, this interaction. So that's the interaction between this independent variable and the covariant. So this interaction is on, this interaction should have effects on that dependent variable. Um, that's how we test the homogeneity of slope assumption. And then if you look at these values, p-value not significant. That is to say, uh, for our hypothesis, say, in the population, maybe there is no significant difference between the covariant uh, and the uh, independent variable. But uh, one thing I want to point out is that we also need to take into account the effect size. So here, if you look at the effect size, partial area square is 0 0.109, so almost 0 0.11. So partial area square is, if you find it's hard to uh, understand partial area square, you can think about it and think about R square in regression. So if you know regression, the R square is to describe how the regression line fits the data, right? And then here it say about 11% uh, this effect is account for the 11% of the variance of the dependent variable. So that's 11% is pretty large, I think. Um, if you remember what we have talked about in previous class, the effect size. So for partial area square, um, usually around point, around, around point zero 0.02 is small, uh, point zero 0.06 medium, and then point one two, point one six is large effect size. So here it's a medium to large effect size. 11% of the variance of that dependent variable can be explained by this interaction effect. So it's pretty large effect. Um, uh, so here you have to make a choice. So you can say, based on these non-significant results, I, I believe the homogeneity of slope assumption is not violated. And then you proceed to do analysis of covariance. This is the one option. And then the other option is say, although this interaction is not significant, considering the medium to large effect size, maybe this non-significance is due to the lack of power of this analysis. Um, so maybe we have a significant result. We could have a significant result if we have larger sample so, from that perspective, the homogeneity slope assumption may be violated, and then we can proceed to do simple main fact analysis for analysis of co covariance. That's another option for you. Um, so actually, you have two options. For this example, um, you decide. And uh, uh, for power, actually, actually, if you Think about why here this interaction has a power effect. So let's look at the uh, sample size here. Um, so uh, we can actually see the descriptive statistics. So here we have a total of 30 individuals, 10 per condition. And based on our experience, say 10 for each condition may be is not a, a large sample. That's why, that's why for this, this interruption, it lacks some power. So if you still remember power, what is power?
So statistically, power is say the ability to detect the significance when the null hypothesis is false. So if you don't have sufficient power, even if in the population it should be it should be a difference, and then you cannot detect that because you have a small sample size. That's the power issue. If you still don't don't uh, believe that you can use power, not use G power to do power analysis, uh, we can. If you really have the time, you can try. So you can do power analysis to test. Uh, uh, Ancova, we are computing this interaction's power post talk, and then. So remember the effect sign is 0 0.109 and then this is a medium to large effect. So if you see Cohen Cf, Cohen Cf, 0.4 is large and then if you transform partial area square to point uh, to uh, Cohen Cf, it's 0 0.349, 0 0.35 almost. So it's medium to large effect size. And then alpha level 0.05, total sample size 30, numerator degrees of freedom should be 2. Independent variable has three levels, so 2, numerator degrees of freedom 2, 3 minus 1. And then number of groups, here we have three groups. And then uh, number of covariant 1, and then we can actually get the power here. So you can see actually for this test the power is just uh, 0 0.34, 0 0.35. That's why if you, we put it in another way, for this interaction it may commit type 2 error. So it should be significant, but you can detect that. So from that perspective, um, we believe this interaction is medium to large effect. And then we believe the homogeneity of slope assumption may be violated. Um, then what we need to do? We do simple main fat analysis. Um, so the idea is say so the idea is say if in the population these three lines are different in terms of slopes, then we need to uh, see the differences for a specific value of the covariant. We can find some typical value of the covariant and then see for a specific value of the covariant what is the difference between groups. So for example, for a covariant with relatively low values, what's the difference between these three groups? And then for a quite typical value of the covariant, which is the mean value of the covariant, what's the difference of the uh, what's the difference between these three groups? And then for a relatively high value of the covariant What's the difference uh, between these three groups? This is our idea to do simple main fact analysis. So uh, let me put it again. If the homogeneity of slope, slope assumption is not violated, then look at this graph. For any value of the covariant, the difference between these three groups should be the same because these lines are parallel. So if the assumption is violated, then these lines are not parallel. That's why the differences are these differences across these three groups are different for almost every 
value of the covariant. That's why we need to do simple main fat analysis. Simple main fat analysis is actually to test the fat for a specific value of the covariant. Then, um, so the uh, technically what we need to do, like I said, we want to find some typical values of a covariant. How can we find typical values of a covariant? So if you really want to, I think the idea is that for typical values, usually we are looking at mean values, right? So mean values, we need to look at the differences when the covariant is at its mean. So that's how we come up with uh, a mean value. And also we want to uh, see when the covariant is relatively small, what is the differences for that? That's why we come up with the idea one standard deviation below the mean. And uh, also, similarly, we want to see for a relatively high value of covariant, what's the difference? One standard deviation above the mean. So why we are doing one standard deviation below the mean and one standard deviation above the mean? So if you remember, um, normal distribution, then the percentage between one standard deviation below the mean and one standard deviation above, above the mean should be 68%, right? If you remember the stand, uh, normal, uh, standardized normal distribution, um, so the area between one standard deviation below the mean and one standard deviation above the mean is 68%, right? So, that's why we think that within one standard deviation, these are, the, these are quite typical values, one standard deviation. So 68%, uh, 34, that's, so it should be one third, this is, uh, one third, one third. So that's a typical value. And uh, um, someone, someone may think that um, we can go more extreme values, like two standard deviations above the mean, or maybe two standard deviations below the mean. If you remember, two standard deviations from the normal distribution it should cover 90% uh, of the area. However, when you have more extreme values, they are very likely to be outliers. So for outliers, they are usually, uh, they usually have large measurement error. That's why I don't recommend you to look at more extreme values like two standard deviations or maybe three standard deviations. If you're looking at uh, a covariant value which is three standard deviations away, it's very likely that you are looking at a outlier, um, which includes large measurement error. Um, I don't recommend that. So we just need to find typical values to represent low, medium, and high values of covariant. So that's why we come up with three typical values, and uh, this is actually suggested by uh, Cohen, Cohen, West and Aiken. Um, okay, so we have the three typical values. So let's look at the graph again. So we want to see the difference between placebo, low vitamin C, and high vitamin C when the covariant is at a relatively low value, when the covariant is at its mean value average value. And also we want to see the difference between placebo, low vitamin C, and high vitamin C when the covariant is at a relatively high value. This is how we conduct simple main fat analysis to look at the uh, differences for a, specific, for a specific value of a covariant. Okay, then, so how can we come up with 
one standard deviation below the mean and one standard deviation above the mean. So we need to have this actual value. So, uh, so we need to come up with the means and the standard deviation for the covariant. Uh, so we can run uh, descriptive statistics. You can do frequency or descriptive, whatever you like, uh, as long as you get the means and the standard deviation. Mean and standard deviation of the covariant. Uh, covariant. Standard deviation mean. Okay. So mean value is 9, and then standard deviation is 5.5. And also, if you, if you look at the uh, ACOVA results, if you look at the uh, ACOVA results, if you forget about testing the homogeneous slope assumptions, Actually, uh, the results you get is actually for the uh, results when the covariant is at its mean. So you can see from this uh, note from the table. So the prior prior is actually the name of the covariant equals nine. So that's telling you these are the results when you are testing the uh, covariant equals to nine. That's the mean value of the covariant. Um, so what we need is to get the um, one standard deviation below the mean, so 9 minus 5.5, and then 9 plus 5.5. We get three values, and then we do simple main fact analysis. You need to do a little bit of syntax. So you need to do a little bit of syntax here. Uh, if, we, if you do ANCOVA, it will only have one line showing estimated means. So let me show you. If we do ANCOVA, If you do ANCOVA, you'll see there is only one line to show in you the results of estimated means. And then here you need to do, um, you need to have three lines to do simple main fat analysis. And also remember, you still need to have the uh, interaction fat. You still need to have the interaction fat. Um, huh? Ready? Okay. Interaction fact. No, uh, I don't think you need to have the interaction fact. So here you need to have three lines of estimated means. So for this line, it's the it's testing the results when the covariant is at its mean value, and then you need to have two more lines here. So for these three lines, you need to have the results for one standard deviation below the mean, one standard deviation at the mean, or one standard deviation uh, above the mean, at the mean, below the mean. Okay, and we can compute them. So you need to do some calculations. The mean value is 9, and then one standard deviation is 5.5, uh, right? Uh, standard deviation is 5.5, so 9 minus 5.5, it's 
3.5, almost 3.5, uh, 3.50, and then 9 plus 5.5, 5. 14.55. Uh, I think we should, okay, let's see if that's in case. I think we are good. So run this syntax. And we run all of this syntax. <coughs> so for each line of the estimated marginal means is actually, so for the first line here is giving you the results when the uh, covariant is at the uh, one standard deviation below the mean, and then the second line is the results when the covariant is at its mean, and then the third line is covariant, the results when the covariant is at uh, one standard deviation above the mean. Uh, so you should have the results. Do you have the results? I don't have the results in my PowerPoint slide. So let's look at the results for SPSS. Uh, I don't have the results on my PowerPoint slides. Uh, so for these first several uh, boxes here, so for the first table, so pay attention here. So estimates, you'll see the, the note here covariance appearing in the model are evaluated at the following value days with calls prior equals 4. So um, for SPSS, SPSS cannot produce 3.50. What's the mean value? One standard. So 3.5. SPSS cannot, cannot print 3.5. So um, it can only do like 4. But actually, the results is at 3.5. It's kind of confusing, but uh, uh, this is actually what the software is doing. Four, so that's one standard deviation below the mean. So these are the adjusted means. Remember, um, in ANCOVA, in ANCOVA, we are having the covariance to control for the effects. And usually, you'll see when you're having the covariance, it can adjust the dependent variable values. So when you have the results, you actually have two means here. If you have the descriptive statistics, so that's a sample mean you can compute. So if you compute these three sample means from your data, then you'll get your sample mean. The sample mean is actually here. So for placebo, that's 11.6 for the dependent variable. And then for low vitamin C, it's 8.4 for the dependent variable. And then for high, high vitamin C, that's 6.4. Remember in uh, ANCOVA, you have the covariant. So the effects of covariant is actually adjusting these values. So these are adjusted means. These are adjusted means when the covariance is at its uh, value 1 SD below the mean. So you will see that's adjusted value 9.499. That's for placebo, 5.203 for low dose vitamin C, and uh, 4.162 4 for high dose vitamin C. And then, usually we do pairwise comparisons. We test the assum assumption. So here, uh, for the groups, we test the null hypothesis. Mu1 equals to mu2 equals to mu3 is significant, and this partial area square is quite large. So 33%, one third of the uh, variance of the dependent variable can be explained by the independent variable, which is a very large effect. And then we reject the null hypothesis. Mu1 equals to mu2 equals to mu3. And then we usually we do pairwise comparisons. So pairwise comparison. These are the pairwise comparisons when the covariant is 
adds the value of one standard deviation below the mean. So let's see the uh, values here. So p values, that's the uh, placebo versus low dose vitamin C, 0 0.01. And then high dose vitamin C versus placebo, 0 0.002. And remember, you, here you also need to control for the type of error. So if you want to use Bonferroni, then remember these p values need to compare to 0 0.05 divided by 3, which is 0 0.0167, right? If you use Bonferroni procedure. Um, so these tables here present to you the results when the covariant, uh -huh, When the covariant is at its mean, which is 9. So these are the adjusted means. You can see when the covariant is 9, the adjusted means here, placebo 12, low vitamin C is almost 8, 7.7, .7, and then for the high dose vitamin C, it's 6.6. Uh, .6. So these are adjusted means. And then uh, these are the p-values. And then, finally, when we are looking at the covert at its relatively high value, which is here, it only print 15. Uh, this is, uh, uh, actually, the software is testing the value at 14.55. Right? So these are the adjusted means for the covariant at a relatively high values, 14-ish, 14, 14 almost 15. And then these are the p-values. Uh, you can see actually the, the results are quite similar. So that's the uh, simple may fat analysis. To test the, um, to test the uh, group mean differences for specific value of the covariant. That's the simple main fat analysis for the uh, analysis of covariants. Um, mm -hmm. Uncle. Uncle. There is a, a document to report the results for ANCOVA when the homogeneity slope assumption is violated. So you can actually take a look at that. Remember, you always need to control for the type of error. Um, usually, I do bomb for only. Um, we cover that in previous class, so I'm not elaborate on that. Uh, there is also exercise. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, I forget to put the data here. So you can actually use the exercise from the previous class, which is depression. I uh, depression. Uh, there is a depression data from last class. Uh, you can use use that to play with the data to do analysis of chorus. So, before we do uh, factor analysis, um, I want to summarize a little bit uh, from class one. We talked about uh, analysis of variance, complex mean comparisons, simple main fact analysis when we have a significant interaction, how to control for type of error. Um, these are the uh, these are the things I think we covered so far. Uh, 